introduce myself. I'm Dr. Tejinder Singh. I, I did my fellowship with Dr. McDonald. So, and Dr. McDonald has been teaching fellowship courses since 2005, if I'm right, Dr. McDonald. Yep. So, and I mean, I think he's been teaching these courses since 2005. And I mean, he's a very, very eminent name in, in manual therapy in the United States. Uh, uh, Dr. McDonald, you can share your presentation. I think I was looking at your presentation. The first slide is your bio, so. Well, I can do the bio if you like there. And we'll, and we'll, to keep us moving along. And I just wanna thank people for joining. I'll be talking about interesting topic, the uh, upper extremity neurodynamics. And from the perspective of looking at differential diagnosis for medial and lateral elbow pain, Someone as an example of the complexity of this topic, it's, it's a very interesting uh, way to look at someone who potentially has elbow pain and start to understand some of the really unique ways we can assess and help people as physiotherapists. I want to give special thanks to Dr. Mark Reinking, one of the uh, fellows of APTA, who I, I teach upper extremity interventions with. Uh, so yeah, a few maps there representing where we are around the world. Sometimes I'm in Australia and sometimes I'm in the United States. Uh, I think many of you are in India and I hope it's not too hot from what I've been seeing, but wherever you are around the world as well. Yes, yeah, so I've been in practice for a little while. I think it's uh, getting close to 30 years now. It's starting to, it starts to get a little scary, but I've been researching in the spine, upper extremity and many other areas for quite a long time. I've educated physiotherapists directly for now approaching 20 years actually now, and I direct orthopedic residencies and fellowships and do other work. So that's too much about me. Let's talk about the topic. So I want people attending today, understand a little bit more the concept of neurodynamics. Now really want to compare that to when we started first talking about neurodynamics and other such things, what we were we used to call it nervous tension. Like one of the classic texts is the mobilization of the nervous system by David Butler. Now, we, it's re, but neurodynamics is the term we'll be talking about today. And thinking about, as a way to learn it, think about differentiating elbow pain from more complex combined presentations, such as double crush. I'll look at, consider some of the special tests we could be doing with regards to this assessment. And I'll just let you know that I'll go back and forth between some videos today. I could demo for myself because it's upper extremity. Uh, they're the property of Regis. The images, though, are open access. No. So let's consider an individual uh, who has like a lateral epicondylitis, the classic name, uh, really an unfortunate and incorrect name in many ways. Uh, like, so what you call tennis elbow, which occurs in approximately one out of 20 people who have it actually play tennis, or medial epicondylite, epicondylitis, which is often called golfer's elbow, and once again occurs in very few people who play golf, but these are just names that can stick. Now, so we think what type of tissue is involved in those two presentations? Lateral epicondalgia, a much better term, because there is minimal inflammation involved unless it's a direct blow, which can happen. There's some microscopic inflammation that can occur with tendon breakdown, but it's typically a anaerobic and non-inflammatory insidious and progressive condition. That's muscular tendinous junction. It's a common tendon of the ECRB, ECRL. So, um, in, and maybe apophysitis in the insertion of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, potentially in lateral epicondalgia. Medial epicondalgia could be the flexor, could be the flexor, common flexor tendon bundle of the forearm, also coming into the medial aspect of the humerus. But that's, so that's soft tissue, that's muscle, that's tendon, that's bony interface. But what about if we think about uh, what might be going on in these type of conditions? Another other local elbow pain presentations. So cubital tunnel syndrome. Now that cubital tunnel, okay, the path of the old nerve, medial aspect of the arm. So that is a neural, neural tissue presentation, almost in the same area of what we call medial epicondylitis. So you're already starting to think, okay, someone could have neural tissue involvement, 
medial elbow, someone could have muscle or tendon tissue involvement. So we have to tease that out further. And what about on the, on the outside of the arm, the lovely confusing anatomy, because like on the lateral aspect, but on the ulnar side of the, the up, distal upper extremity, you could have radial tunnel syndrome, the two red boxes, if it's like the old rule of nine people might use around the elbow, these nine squares, where radial tunnel would be these two, and median nerve irritation could be these two. So this would be an individual who might have a sensory pain radiation that's coming almost exactly from the same point of the lateral forearm where someone might complain of lateral epicondalgia. And this is, might be someone who has pain against resisted pronation, supination, or just pain at rest in that arm. Now, so there's, there's these, so I'll talk a little bit more about some of the differentiation about these elbow presentations. But that's thinking locally. Now, if we continue the thought process locally, you've got nerve entrapment syndrome to occur in the elbow at that point. You could have the, again, as I mentioned, the ulnar nerve could be creating the uh, compression or you, uh, within the Guillaume's, Guillaume's Canal, very, very common in people who ride bikes a long time, cyclists or if you're leaning on a motorbike or a scooter. Uh, that's why if people wear gloves, there's often a, a natural pad right here to try and protect the ulnar nerve. There'd be a compressive neuropathy, but thinking about the elbow again, it could radiate into the elbow, cubital tunnel, or it could be both. You could actually be getting uh, a double crush dis uh, distally, and then the periphery where you're compressing the ulnar nerve in the Guillain's canal and because of the repeated loading of having your arm for hours in this position, you could get the ulnar nerve at the exact same time. So two neural inputs, none of them muscle or tendon. Okay. Now, median nerve could be presenting, uh, oops, I apologize, that jumped. The median nerve could be presenting uh, because of pronator syndrome. That's this image here in the blue background. This would be like, resist, like some resisting pronation could get pressure through the pronator teres directly on the median nerve, sending symptoms down the arm. Now, if you think, because that compression is happening a little higher up than say the carpal tunnel, it's gonna affect the median nerve from that point down. So you'll have numbness throughout the hand potentially on the median side. Unlike carpal tunnel, where you may not have numbness in your palm, because if the compression is just at the carpal tunnel, the cutaneous nerve, the distal cutaneous nerve to the, oh, to, to the palm actually escapes and goes over the tunnel. So if someone's got compression at the carpal tunnel, they're probably just going to be the fingers. But if it's up in the pronator teres, it's going to be, the, it's going to be include the palm as well as the fingers. Radial nerve, again, which is right up against lateral epicondalgic type pain. Now that you could have with the radial nerve, pain radiating down your forearm from a point of compression that is essentially, if you came from the classic point of the ECRB, ECRL, and just rolled slightly towards you, medialized, you get the radial tunnel. And that can create burning pain, sensory burning pain down the back of the hand. It's not tennis elbow, it's not lateral epicondalgia, it's actually radial nerve. Now you're producing it here, but is it coming from there? So that's another consideration. Now, if you're getting some more, a couple other interesting ones uh, in the forearm is anterior interosseous nerve. It's motor only, it's a branch of the median nerve. So the compression is just a little further down. You just might have a AIN syndrome and where you, can, where you can't do this with pressure. If you try and do that, this happens, okay? because you have, you have issues with paresis of the flexor digitorum profundus and longus muscles. So you, can do, you, can go, you can't go tip to tip with pressure and hold on to something. If you try, your hand collapses. Or posterior interosseous, which is a deep branch off radial, not median, where you're gonna have weakness in your thumb and finger extension, which is this long curvy green line. So this is just, this is more distal upper extremity neural entrapments to consider, but 
we need to step back and look at the big picture of what might be going on in some of these some of these individuals. Yeah. So, and so depending where nerves are compressed, sometimes they don't create motor problems, and sometimes they do. Like I saw that question: if your compression to the arcade of Frosch near the supinator, radial nerve is just a sensory issue. If you get radial nerve compression up in the humerus after a fracture, you're going to get atrophy. You'll get the weakness associated with radial nerve dysfunction, inability to extend the wrist, and so forth. So the points of compression can be really de determining. Okay. So here's an important question about discussion today, though, with neurodynamics. Do the nerves in the upper extremity start in the arm? Now, that's a, I think that's an obvious question. No, they start in the cervical spine, at least in terms of the peripheral from the from the from the ganglions from the spinal cord, and then they extend down into the arm. That image shows in the lower extremity the concept of double crush. So it's it's quite unusual to see just a pure nerve compression in the distal upper extremity. It can happen if there's a traumatic injury, but if there's no traumatic injury involved, if it more just came on, and someone's got medial, uh, medial or lateral elbow pain and it's burning, and they may or may not be showing motor weakness, but there isn't like fall on the arm, arm got trapped between something. You've really got to be thinking what's happening along the whole path of the nerve. Is this in reality a radiculopathy or a double crush presentation where the nerve is under more than one point of compromise. Yes. So in the image on the right, posterior of the, the female subject, the, the pain that someone might be saying is carpal tunnel in their wrist could just as much be coming from the origins of the median nerve tissues in the cervical spine in isolation or both from the cervical spine and from compression in the wrist around the carpal tunnel. Very common presentation uh, in many individuals who do a lot of upper extremity and sustained work. Now, in the third trimester of pregnancy is where you'll classically see a true carpal tunnel presentation just due to fluid retention, fluid retention and due to the slim nature of the wrist that fluid retention creates numbness in the hands, especially, especially during sleeping. Classic carpal tunnel presentation goes away postpartum. But many individuals who have been, who get diagnosed with, with medial lateral elbow pain, cubital tunnel syndrome, tennis elbow, carpal tunnel actually have a cervical spine issue. So how do you tease that out? And, and how do you tease out the health of the whole nerve? So, this is a remember the anatomy time right now. The brachial plexus <clears throat> has a tremendous amount of what you would call built-in obsolescence uh, or built-in redundancy, correction, a built-in redundancy because of the, the branching and the interaction between branches, the cords and divisions. So it also has in inherent flexibility in its design so it can move around from exiting the neck moving through the anterior triangle into the upper extremity but pain in the elbow as an example could be derived from the nerve root levels you have direct spinal compression c5 c6 you might have pain going to the lateral aspect of the arm you you could have compression occurring in the trunks the cords or the branches so the, the elbow, you can see, like, is sort of thought of predominantly as C6, but there's so much overlap that you need a little bit more information when you try and tease this out. Because when you think about C5 to C7 level irritations, could, yeah, they, they could produce median or radial nerve impairments. C7, T1 irritations could produce medial or could produce medial pain though via the ulnar nerve. Okay, that's why I say the anatomy is, uh, the language is tough around the elbow at times. 
because you've got medial elbow pain in the ulnar nerve, or you could have more lateral elbow pain coming or coming down the middle of the cubital fossa from the median nerve or the radial nerve coming off a little higher up in the cervical spine. But so these are options to consider. Uh, it's very easy to give someone a diagnosis in the medical field of like lateral elbow pain, tennis elbow, as I said, but it's very rarely just that. It's generally a lot more complex. And that's where our differential work can come in. Because if you think about the, uh, uh, the, the cords, the divisions and the trunks, you consider a syndrome such as thoracic outlet syndrome. Thoracic outlet syndrome, yes, it can be a vascular compression, subclavian. It can be a mixed neural and vascular compression, brachial plexus and subclavian. But 90 plus percent of the time, it's a neural compression between the clavicle and the first rib or between maybe the scalenes uh, uh, of, in, in the cervical spine on the upper brachial plexus. And this is one... I'm not saying this is a classic way to get pure medial, medial lateral elbow pain. It's actually a way to get a very confusing distal upper extremity presentation. Okay. So that depends on your level of uh, uh, confidence, level of understanding with this type of information. Double D... How common is it for an individual with upper extremity pain to actually have a double cross going on? We used to think of it as fairly rare, but studies have shown that people with elbow pain, up to 80% of them respond to primary cervical interventions. Makes you start thinking a very large percentage of people have involvement that you might be like double crush. But a lot of those individuals might have started with a local issue but because it was ongoing, it sensitized the cervical spine or they became guarded in their movement and they developed a secondary point of compression. Yes, if you have the ability to have nerve conduction testing, you can tease some of this out as Dr. Singh put into the, put into the chat. But many of us don't have that on hand to do NCV, uh, nerve conduction velocity assessments, and they're fairly invasive. But clinically, you can start to apply some of these testing procedures to make the differential yourself. In your clinics. So yes, be it, so thoracic outlet is, is an example of the complexity of the neural innovation to the upper extremity and how it can give you a very mixed picture because it happens higher up in the neural system, but it's <clears throat> within the branches and the cords and all that interplay between the neural tissue that once it gets to the upper extremity, creates the media and the radial, the ulnar nerve and other, and other nervous tissue. That is the correct, that is the article indeed, Cleland's 2004, Josh's article showed that with regards to the positive response to cervical thoracic intervention for, for lateral elbow pain. So we need to think though about the whole neural cylinder. Right, so think about median and ulnar nerves here. Anywhere from the origin to the distal termination of the nerve neurofibrils, the nerve tissue, you could have compression, entrapment, or irritation. Uh, this diagram gives you that nice side. If you think about medial sided elbow pain, any points of compression, median nerve, ulnar nerve above the elbow or at the elbow could create a medial, mid to medial elbow pain presentation. And chronic irritations beyond, could beyond, such as at the carpal tunnel, Guillain's canal, could start to radiate back up <clears throat> the arm and give you a medial elbow pain presentation. The elbow is a little bit like the knee. It's somewhat like, it's sort of like, it's dependent upon what happens between the ha wrist hand and the shoulder. And the knee is what happens between the foot, ankle, and the hip, unless there's a direct trauma. <clears throat> so we need to assess the whole nerve path and then make a determination of where the impairment for that person is, or in reality, where the multiple points of impairment are. And it is a little more complicated than that. But, so 
I want to put that thought in front of you that what might be considered a reason, not too complex presentation, someone has medial lateral elbow pain, might actually be quite a lot more complicated where they have multiple points of compression, they may have cervical spine involvement, and they may have impairments in the dynamics of the neural system, which I'm gonna talk about in just a little bit. Now, I just wanted to say, uh, TJ or PK, did you wanna make a brief comment here from, IS, uh, from ISOMP like we did previously? Do that if you wish, or I'll keep rolling. Hello, Dr. McDonald. How are you? This is- I'm Keith. very good, Dr. Kumar. How are you, sir? Good. All right. So, Dr. Tija, are you there? All right. I don't know if he's there or not. Uh, so, guys, uh, I hope you are enjoying your uh, elbow lecture course over there. Dr. TJ, are you there? Oh, sorry. So the brief message that uh, we would like to give all the people over there is that International Sports and Orthopedic Manual Therapy, it's an organization which uh, specializes in manual therapy. And we have eminent speakers like Dr. McDonald and various others. So you can check our website, the isom.com, and uh, we would be uh, we are actually doing our manual therapy program and Dr. McDonald, our third batch will be starting this June. So I just wanted to people to know that, uh, yes, this is a free live lecture for all, but if in case you wish to learn more in our certificate courses in the whole manual therapy program, based on the guidelines of American Academy of Orthopedic Manual Physical Therapy and Dr. McDonald himself is like is the fellowship uh, instructor. Uh, so, you're welcome to look up at our website and look up at the manual therapy program. Uh, we will also share the information on our WhatsApp group and a different email. And without taking much time, Dr. McDonald, you can go for it, sir. Thank you. Oh, I always appreciate the invitation to talk to your group. And uh, <clears throat> yes, let's keep rolling. If I can keep the technology moving. All right. So. The concept that I really wanted to get, so I've sort of set a framework there that if you are going to really differentiate out what could, what could be medial or lateral elbow pain, you need to be looking from the cervical spine out. This means assessing uh, what, uh, what happens to symptoms with central cervical spine assessment, especially including compression and distraction to unload or to load the cervical spine and see if that creates a radiating symptom presentation. You need to look at neuromobility assessment of those primary nerves, median ulnar radial. And we, this is classically called cervical screening and, and it was classic called nerve tension mobility assessment. But I wanna talk about in a little bit, it's neurodynamics and what that term means that gives us further information too. So you could, these are some of the components of a cervical examination for elbow pain, uh, which is beneficial when it's not obvious. Like if someone has just fractured their radial head, it's fairly ob obvious. <clears throat> but if someone just has, I'm not, this is like last three or four months, I've started to develop pain in my elbow, either outside or inside. I do a lot of overhead work. Uh, I use hand tools a lot, or I'm doing a lot of I'm doing a lot of domestic tasks. I'm doing a lot around the house. I'm riding my bike a lot. No specific trauma. Some assessments you might want to look at could be uh, upper cervical ligament assessment, uh, or it could be looking at cervical range of motion over pressure. So I can play. I can link into a couple of videos here, and let me just. Uh, I'm just gonna. If I go in here, now I am gonna make the presumption that you cannot hear. So Dr. Kumar, Dr. Singh, just let me know if I need to voice over these. Sure, sir. Uh, I mean, are you playing any kind of a video side by? Yes, it should be on screen. If that's not showing on screen, let me know. No, you have to stop sharing this one, sir, and then start with the other one. I mean, because right now we can see your presentation. 
Okay, is it on screen now? Yes, it's on screen now, correct. I bet you probably can't hear it. So if I, so this is, so if say, if, I'll give the voiceover. So this individual who has some medial elbow pain, I'm starting by looking at the effects of cervical flexion. And now I'm gonna compressively load into the cervical flexion to see if that reproduces the right elbow pain. Actually left elbow pain, I apologize. And I'm gonna look at under extension and I'm going to look at compressive loading of the cervical facets, closing of the foramens, my right hand stabilizing the upper thoracic and that's a direct compression, does it reproduce the elbow pain? Okay. Now this in essence is a, on that right side, that's gonna create closing. So it's a Sperling's test, but coming from the side, does it create symptoms down into the right elbow? Not for this individual. And some of this is just for demonstration. But if I now rotate right, cause right-sided closing in the cervical spine, and I load into that again, does it create symptoms into the upper extremity? So I just wanted to give that as one example of a cervical assessment that could be included. Now, here's uh, uh, another one that is very useful. And many of you will do cervical upper extremity uh, assessments of reflexes, but this is what I wanted to show is that in this video, I'm not gonna use a tendon hammer. I'm gonna look for hyperreflexia. And, and this is often missed. So in this, what I'm gonna do here is just put my finger over the biceps tendon and just put a very light nail bed flick of the biceps tendon. And if that reproduces the reflex with a very low stimulus, or the individual may often complain of having a responsive cervical pain, that might suggest the hypersensitization of the median nerve. Ulna, like triceps reflex here, ulna, again, I just, <clears throat> you can very lightly load a reflex uh, to identify hyperflexia, which is often missed. Now, is it central cord? Might do a Hoffman's test. A Hoffman's test flicking the nail bed of the second finger, looking for flexion of the thumb. This individual is not positive. I've seen quite a few positives. That would suggest compression of the spinal cord like cervical myelopathy. Looking for a reverse supinator here, which would also indicate a cervical myelopathy. Now, this is just giving you the idea. Yes, so Hoffman's test could be enough from a neuron lesion. Now, so if someone's got an elbow pain presentation, it's a lot more complex than just looking at their elbow. So further to this, uh, I don't wanna use all the time going through the upper extremity, but the, the last uh, cervical, but cervical distraction assessment could be very useful if someone's got elbow pain again. So in this scenario, this person has their right arm pain, um, and what I'm gonna do is create a distraction to, to lengthen the cervical spine, open up the cervical facets, <coughs> and see if the symptoms in the upper extremity diminish. Now, you can do it with one hand or two hands. And in this case, I'm gonna do a subcranial nod, which is more of an upper cervical distraction. Or you could change flexion angles. Now, but many people only get symptoms when they're sitting at a desk doing a work job. So in this situation, I'm going to look at distraction in sitting. I'm going to have this individual sit tall, can think about their elbow symptoms, and then they relax, but I prevent the, the subcranial region from coming down with them. And as they relax their body, they distract. If that takes the symptoms out of the elbow and the arm, I've really got to make sure I manage the cervical spine in that presentation. Now, you could do upper cervical ligament assessment. You could certainly do more. The last one I'll show is a Sperling segmental. Now the Sperling's test types A, B are out there classically described as like side bending or side bending and rotation with compression. But if you wanna get more specific about this, have an individual, so that's a classic Sperling's, one of the me mechanisms in place that, that I'm showing here. But now 
What I'll do with my right hand is I'm going to contact the posterior facet of the articular pillar in the cervical spine, C45, C56, C67, and I could go down to C7, T1. And what's happening there is by using that segmental approach, by having my hand into those segments, I'm looking to reproduce the symptoms specifically in the arm from a specific segment in the neck. All right, okay. Sony, like the cervical distraction test will typically alleviate symptoms. So cervical distraction assessment is when symptoms are present. That's a great question, Jyoti. Uh, so if someone has symptoms, you want to turn them off. And if you can turn the symptoms off, you can then create a diagnostic profile. If someone doesn't have the symptoms at that time or they're mild, you want to turn them on or gently increase them. That way you get your diagnostic profile. So yes, uh, this Spurling's test with segmental compression at different segments is designed to reproduce turn on symptoms to let you know if the cervical spine is involved and how much. The distraction assessment gapping is to turn symptoms off. Okay, I appreciate that question. So let's, if we get back into the presentation. So that's some of the probably important intervention assessments you want to look at the cervical spine in somebody who has elbow pain presentation. I mentioned the Hoffman's pathological reflex assessment that I showed you in that video as a component of upper extremity reflex assessment. And I'm going to reinforce the point. We sometimes just get the tendon hammer out and just do a, like an assessment looking for a reflex. If someone has a reflex, we say they're fine. That is a big mistake many times. You want to find out if someone has a reflex on a very subtle test. And that'll tell you that they have a mild form of hyperreflexia going on and they're getting potential central cord compression. But if you don't look for it, you won't know. The inverted supinator, which is also a sign of myelopathy, very high likelihood ratio. And I showed that as part of the assessment, looking for that, uh, where the fingers might flex or the elbow pushes into extension. So here's the critical piece though, neurodynamics. So we've set the stage, someone's got elbow problems, medial or lateral. You think the cervical spine's involved, or you think they've got a local tissue involvement, maybe compression down in the forearm as well. But what about the whole neural cylinder? Okay. This used to be called neural tension assessment. Back in the early 1990s, when I was first introduced to it, most of you weren't alive then. Uh, uh, this was called neural tension assessment because what we used to think was you're just assessing if the nerve can glide or what happens to the nerve when you stretch it. Uh, so, uh, oh. So the because like the classic slump test position creates the most elongation of the whole the neuraxis as as it was called, <clears throat> but but that's really just the mechanical part. Yes, there are the mechanics of the median nerve. It has to move through the upper extremity. Okay, if you put your hand like this, turn your head, tilt your head away, maximal excursion median nerve. That's the mechanical bit, but there's also the chemical component. Is there a resting metabolic healthy status or unhealthy status in the tissues? Diabetes is a classic example of something that could be a metabolic situation where what would be a normal glide of the median nerve is actually painful, not because the nerve can't glide, not because the, it's getting trapped in tissues, but because <clears throat> the usual amount of chemical response to that is much higher because the person has a metabolic condition condition. And then there's the electrical aspect of the neurodynamics as well. Someone could have a demyelinating disorder. Yes, the more severe like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or it could be much more subtle. Someone could have had a, compress a compressive neuropathy at the cubital tunnel, suffered some myelination, suffered some swan cell damage in the elbow. And when you add into that on a nerve distraction, working overhead, trying to twist a light gob or something. The component of the demyelination 
as well as the mechanical combines to create the symptoms. <clears throat> so we had to change the term. It's no longer, it, it, it used to be, you only just thought about the mechanical mobility of the nerve. Now we have to think about mechanical function, the chemical status, and the ability of the nerve to conduct electrical impulses. Uh, and so it's the dynamics of the whole system. So I'm looking at Ritu's question. For patients having pain in both sides, medial lateral of the elbow, a frozen shoulder, what will be the way to start a valent treatment? Well, <clears throat> Rita, I'd say the likelihood there is the, uh, you're starting to get the, the uh, pathways of the brachial plexus involved in the inferior auxiliary portion of the glenohumeral joint with frozen shoulder. And so that would be a discussion for another day, but you really need to assess the capsule mobility of the glenohumeral joint and the relative mobility of the scapula and the thorax. See if that person also has uh, almost like a thoracic outlet issue related to the, or uh, a brachial plexus mobility impairment in the inferior auxiliary region. But it's a great example. Yeah, signs of plexopathy, as, as Dr. Singh notes, you could just, you could depress the shoulder girdle and see if the symptoms in the elbow increased because that would increase the tension through that inferior auxiliary region as well. Okay. Now, I appreciate those questions. I try and get them when they pop up. Technology from 10,000 miles away. Okay. So, but there's a more to it. Sorry, neurodynamics also is the cortical processing of the information. You could have normal mechanical glide. You could have normal peripheral electrical impulse conduction down the neural system. Your, my, your, my, your myelin properties, your axoplasmic flow, that could all be normalized. And you could have normal soft tissue interfaces wrapping around the nerves. The pronated teres can be quite happy around the median nerve. Your, your path of the radial nerve uh, could be fine. But if supracortically, there's issues in central neural tissue processing that information, you could have pain generation doing a normal repetitive task where the brain interprets it as harmful. Okay. So again, that's the whole dynamics of the entire neurodynamic presentation. So what could, and so when we look at the assessment uh, of somebody say again with medial or lateral elbow pain, there's a lot more to be ruled out depending on the history, on the history. Now, I'm seeing Hassan's question about release phenomena in TOS. I think that's re relating to um, if you have compression in, in the subclavian region or when you take the compression off, then the symptoms come on. And Hassan, you can comment further in chat if you wish. But release phenomenons, depending on how the term is being used, typically relate to it's like a rebound when the compression comes off, the pain comes on. Because you almost you almost are blocking the pain signaling with the compression, but then when you release it, you suffer the consequences of the trauma to the tissue locally. Okay. So, so if I start, if I show some demonstration videos of myself here doing these upper upper limb, what used to be called upper limb tension tests, but are now called upper limb neurodynamic tests. <clears throat> This is start to make sense of the way I go about it. Now, little ways to remember these, if you're not familiar with them, if they are, that's fine. Median nerve is like me. I don't wanna say it's all about me, but uh, elbow extension, wrist extension, you can see for ulnar nerve and radial nerve. Note here, it's the relative compression or tension in the central cervical spine region. It's a critical factor in this neurodynamic assessment. <clears throat> and depression or elevation of the shoulder is also very important. Uh, and I'll let you know when these, when these were first described by Butler and Shatlock and others uh, a, nearly three or four, de four decades ago, the shoulder girdle used to be depressed 10 degrees, thinking that you had to put at least some tension in the brachial plexus through the shoulder girdle 
to have a sensitive enough assessment of what was happening in the arm of these three nerves. A quarter century has told us that that's way too much load, that you'd simply stabilize the shoulder girdle. Otherwise, you'll give everyone a double crust just in your assessment. Now, if you have absolutely no symptoms showing up, maybe you should compress the shoulder a little further if the person's telling you at times the elbow gives them pain, the distal forearm gives them pain, and you're still trying to work out the brachial plexus, uh, upper neural tissues are involved. And that might be someone who wears a heavy backpack and has totally got used to loading through the shoulder girdle and it's become normalized for them. But you don't start there. It's too aggressive. It used to be, so we've learned to be less aggressive. So what I'll do here is, so let's say if I looked at median nerve neurodynamics, I'll describe, so this is an individual who I'm considering has a medial nerve, potential median nerve impairment. I'm just using the model here. That this individual did, did have some um, elbow pain with neural tension. Okay, so I'm setting this person up into a classic median nerve assessment. Their cervical spines in neutral. First, I'm gonna take the thumb and the first two, second and third fingers and put them on mild tension, stabilizing the shoulder and not depressing it, but just not letting it elevate. Externally rotate, I've got the wrist in extension. And that's when she first felt tension actually, in this case. So I've let the wrist come off and I'm saying, does the tension go away if they're at the wrist off? Okay, now a little further down. So I let the wrist come out of extension, symptoms might go away. All right, so I'm starting to think peripherally, what is happening to the peripheral components of that median nerve? Now, if I unload the cervical spine components, if I shorten the tissues from the neck, that takes the tension off of the upper part of the median nerve path, then it puts it back on. Okay, so again, stabilize shoulder girdle, externally rotate, move wrist extension, starting to look at how much elbow extension the person has, and then look at the cervical spine components to see does shortening or lengthening at the cervical spine change the person's presentation. It is a very dynamic assessment to do neurodynamic interventions. Yeah, Jody, musculocutaneous nerve, we don't really have a, an established way of doing that because you, it doesn't cross the elbow in essence. Well, it's, you know, it's so some of the, like, we have median ulnar and radial nerve pretty well established, but not musculocutaneous. I asked him the question from Lilo about, about a complete brachial plexus injury. Prognosis, very questionable. You'd have to manage it quickly. Um, like most of these assessments, I'm going to show you radial and ulnar as well, deal with what we considered uh, neuropraxias, like early compression intervention. And neuropraxias is what we typically deal with in the physiotherapy world. That's where you haven't actually had axonal damage and Wallerian degeneration down the nerve. Someone who's had a complete brachial plexus injury typically has actually just had neuropraxia in multiple points, like maybe a birth traction injury, or they've fallen and they've got classic shoulder stinger. Generally, put them in a sling, unload them for a couple of weeks, avoid excessive cervical mobility, uh, maintain motor function in the upper extremity, work the soft tissue throughout the brachial plexus region. But <clears throat> you've got to constantly reassess someone who's had a complex brachial plexus trauma. Uh, be, uh, because they could develop a lot, they could recover the neural tissue over time, but then have subsequently altered neurodynamics in all of these nerves. So that's a true test of your skill as a physio to deal with someone who's had a brachial plexus injury that's more complex than a single nerve. Auxiliary nerve doesn't really have a tension test. You could, you could internally rotate the humerus because, but often people have an anterior shoulder dislocation will damage the auxiliary nerve and they, the deltoid waste that's wastes away. So where the nerves don't, because it's when the nerves cross the elbow that things get really complicated because you're dealing with elbow flexion, extension and supination pronation. If the nerves don't cross the elbow and they simply go, they terminate in the upper arm, you're only really dealing with glenohumeral and scapulothoracic mechanics in terms of the nerve path and you'll have influences from the cervical spine too. That's why we have a lot more information about radial ulnar medial nerve. Um, 
and so on. Just to, just to answer that question that Vikas presented. Now, so if I wanted to look at similar, let's look at radial nerve because radial nerve is one that you really want to be thinking about if someone's got the old classic tennis elbow diagnosis, which as I've discussed is not really accurate for almost anyone. Uh, so if someone's got, this will be assessing the radial nerve and it's a little different because you've got this more complicated setup in some ways. So you're gonna stabilize the shoulder girdle through the proximal humerus. I'm gonna stop the humerus from elevating and I'm gonna drop into a little bit of extension. The wrist is in flexion, a little bit of ulnar deviation. And in this individual that immediately brought on symptoms right around that ink, ink marking on their forearm, the lateral aspect of it. Now, and when they folded their neck over, nothing changed. But when I took their wrists, in this individual, the symptoms were on there. The neck didn't change anything. But when I took the tension off the wrist, the symptoms went away. So in that individual, it was a peripheral compression along the radial nerve and did not involve the cervical spine. So you, knowing which part of the system that you are taking the tension on or off helps you determine, is this more of a cervical or is this more of a distal upper extremity impairment? The last one in the group is ulnar neurodynamics. I got a lot of screens open here, so I hope it's still gonna work. Uh, but ulnar neurodynamics is sort of in, it's similar to the median nerve for setup, setup position. But this time it's the fourth and fifth digits that I'm emphasizing. So right here in the setup, I've emphasized the fourth and fifth digits as being under some extent, uh, some extension load, not the thumb and first, like in the median, first, second, third, like the median nerve. Again, the cervical spine is in neutral to start. If you don't start in a neutral position, you're pre-biasing the cervical spine. Jody, the, uh, extension range testing and radial nerve might only be 10 or 20 degrees. You just sort of need to, uh, you're looking for symptom reproduction. So a little statement point, I'm showing affected side assessment here. In all of these scenarios, you would assess the non-affected side first so that you get a normal baseline for the person. That would be a lot of videos. So make notes to self, you're not always already doing it. You try to tease out neurodynamics in the upper extremity, test the unaffected side first, so you know what that person's normal is. Okay. I'm looking at Manoj's question about supraclavicular nerve syndrome. That one's not something I've looked at. Supraclavicular is like clavicular bracing as part of thoracic outlet assessment, arms directly behind the back, costoclavicular bracing. Okay, that would be one way to look at that. Uh, so I'm gonna keep this going. So ulnar nerve, and like these tests can be considered fairly routine, but they're not. Because my left hand here is assessing to see, does the shoulder girdle try to lift up against my hand? That would suggest tension in the brachial plexus region or is there pressure against, back against my right palm more because of distal tissue restriction or ulnar nerve? Or is the person's head sliding towards me because there's more of a cervical component? If that's not happening, so that's what I'm doing there is flossing the wrist on and off to see if it changes symptoms. With any of these three assessments, you wanna be very good at starting from a situation where there are no symptoms or very mild, and then going to the point when they first change. When they first change, that's when you start to do your differential work. Can I make them more? Can I make them less? And what do I move to change them? Do I move the wrist? Do I move the elbow? Do I move the scapula, the shoulder girdle? Do I move the cervical spine? So how does that compare? So in this case, right there, we've unloaded the cervical components to see so I've got this person to a position where they're feeling their symptoms, not, not 
strong, but enough to recognize them. Because you don't want to make them really strong because you could take, you, this unloading the cervical spine could be helpful for the person, but if you've made it so that you've really wound their arm up, it's too much and it's not going to change anything. So there's, there's a lot of subtlety involved in these neurodynamic assessments. You need to be, it's just like reflex assessment. Once you've learned to do it a few hundred times, then you use less force each time. You become more refined about it. You develop your hands-on manual skills and you'll get better information. Okay. And I appreciate that Dr. Singh is answering some of the more complex questions in the chat. It saves me. Okay, so in this scenario, for this individual, what my hand showed there was that predominantly, like with her radial assessment, the symptoms were driven in the distal upper extremity, where the nerve fibers are smaller, thinner. Uh, so there's actually less give in them. And the cervical wasn't, cervical components were not driving her presentation. So her presentation, a lot of, office work, a lot of desk work is predominantly more from tissue tightness in the distal forearm, uh, both on the volar and dorsal aspects, affecting radial and medial nerves. Ulnar nerve didn't really have much effect except just the tissue tension. Now. Now, I put a little point there that Consider, consider how one would adapt the in the presence of elbow pain medial There's no real specific derived descriptions of how to change upper neurodynamic assessment for medial lateral elbow pain. Uh, but what I would offer is that just like any good diagnostic approach we take, you need to identify the symptoms where they first present and use that as a starting point. So if I'm here, I just want to make sure I'm on screen. If I get ulnar nerve symptoms here, but I don't get them here, then this is my starting point for assessment. Does, does that change it? Does this make it worse? Does that let it off? Does that increase it? Does this make it stronger? Does that let it off? Which of those is more significant? Whichever one is more significant points to the area of more tension. If this is if this is more significant, cervical spine more involved. Right? Or if this doesn't give any relief, this does give relief, then maybe it's more, um, it's more tissue-based in the forearm. So, uh, and again, that's the more mechanical part of it. We, that you still have to consider there could be a demyelination going on, electrical. And there could be a diabetic or other metabolic profile that sets the person up for the symptoms, syndromes in the first place. Okay. People asking about, you still prescribe nerve side glides in a case where there's a cervix. Yeah, uh, that's the, it's the, it's the beauty of the neural system. Uh, you, I'll certainly use neurodynamic mobilization where there's a primary cervical impairment because things don't typically happen in isolation. Yes, someone's primary problem might be the neck, cervical spine. But if you could do neurodynamic glides, maybe like the median nerve, and then you reassess their neck and it's 10, 20% better. You've done some of them. You're actually treating the neck using the nerve as an internal floss. Okay. Yeah. But you but you don't want to forget to do primary cervical spine interventions. Okay. Manaj asked any SC joint problems to create TOS. Well, if someone's had a sternoclavicular joint trauma and the clavicle can't roll, it could certainly implicate in hyperabduction where the clavicle needs to posteriorly roll, that someone could develop TOS. But that, that might be how that comes about. Okay. Just looking at our time. All right. So we're pretty close on the time we wanted to look at. So just a little quick couple of case things you can think about this. A couple of slides and we'll be done. So think, oh, I'm giving the answer too quick. My bad. 24 year old worker with a right lateral elbow pain. They said it was tennis elbow. Never played tennis in their life. But is using an elbow strap and it's getting worse. So five years ago, I had a whiplash injury in a car accident. Hmm. Symptoms come on and off with typing, burning pain back of forearm. 
doesn't have any weakness. So no motor involvement, primary sensory, prior history of maybe a cervical trauma that didn't fully resolve, been told they have tennis elbow, and we've been given the classic tennis elbow strap, which I think you can see in that image. I've got too many screens open. Yeah, there it is. So what's the false flag here? Well, I gave it away and I showed it too quick, but cervical spine is the false flag. It's not a cervical issue, probably. Main problem is radial tunnel syndrome. And the way you really made it obvious is when you did a compression over the radial tunnel with the tennis elbow brace, you made the symptoms worse. So you need to look at the radial tunnel and the effect of soft tissue entrapment in the distal forearm in that individual. Yes, Priya, you have it. Second one. I'll try not to give it away too quick this time. So 47-year-old delivery driver, left medial elbow pain. They said it was golfer's elbow. Does really like to play golf, but happens to be right-handed. Hmm. Only has pain on a follow-through. Right-handed golfer, follow through. What position's that left elbow in? Makes you think. Because golf elbows, golfer's elbow is classically described as the impact medial valgus force to the elbow from hitting the ground. This person's pain's not when they hit the ground, it's at follow through when they're in a ulnar nerve neurodynamic loading position. This person had a, was in a car accident five years ago with their nephew who had whiplash. She had left lower leg pain for about six, six months. Yes, these people were in the same car crash. This person's symptoms come on when they're combing their hair, especially when they're going over the top with their left arm. Notice weakness with gripping objects at the end of the day. This one, is there a false flag in this one? Mm -hmm. So golf's the false flag. It's not hitting the ground. The, it's in the follow through, the person's actually doing an ulnar nerve neurodynamic loading assessment. Main problem is ulnar nerve neurodynamics with a double crush, cubital tunnel, and lower cervical spine involvement from that car accident five years ago. So couple, couple, yep. Oh, yes. Yep. Akshata, sorry, I'm sorry if I pronounced names wrong. Exactly right. So I'm hoping that you that, that should be it. We've been answering questions as I've gone. I want to stop the share. I just want to thank you for allowing me to come and give you a little talk today. And I appreciate the opportunity. And I hope there's some information that's useful for you. Many of you have this knowledge. But let's just recognize the complexity of what we do as physiotherapists and that we always are learning. And someone with Simple elbow pain may not be that simple at all. All right. So do you want to just close out some comments there? Uh, TJ, Dr. Singh, go for it. And I just thank you for letting me come and have a chat. I think always pleasure to listen to you. I mean, I always take some important points. I mean, especially the point with depression, because I mean, a lot of us do that mistake where we check near dynamics at the 10 degree depression. So that was a good point, I mean which I added, I mean, to my knowledge. And uh, I mean, it's always been a pleasure listening to you. I mean. Okay, well, maybe we'll take the recording off and we'll just let people go. We had a nice, we had a nice attendance there. Yeah. Uh, if you guys have more questions, please feel free to ask. I mean, I think we'll be here for at least five to 10 more minutes if you have any questions. I saw one. Treatment of radial cubital tunnel. Yeah, we didn't really talk about treatment today. Like we could be here for a long time, but one of the classic treatments is to do a really nice job of the neurodynamic, to be very good hands-on at actually doing neurodynamic gliding. And people ask about dosing a lot. And really maybe a simpler way to think about it. If you can turn the symptoms on and off gently, if you can turn them on and off gently, then you can see if after 10 or 15 reps, they go away. Uh, I know some people will say very early on, if someone's got radial cubital tunnel syndrome that's hot, very, very sharp, you don't want to actually touch those symptoms at all. Like you might be like, okay, very sharp pain here. Okay, let's just glide you just here. You can't feel anything and then reassess it again. Yeah, that's maybe. I'm a little, maybe I'm a little bit more, I'm a little more aggressive. I'll be like, okay, 
I want you to be able to turn it on, off, on, off. And as long as it doesn't get worse, you're starting to retrain because it's about the whole neurodynamics, just not the mechanics. If the symptoms aren't actually coming on and off, you're not retraining the brain. So uh, there's that component. Yeah, but local tissue work, dry needling work, like cervical thoracic manual interventions, they're all very beneficial. Okay, so, but yeah, if you do more of the coursework with advice on, you can do the courses they offer, you can learn a lot more of these hands-on approaches. And I just find it really interesting how complicated someone with elbow pain can be. So I just, I see this other question. Differences in use of neurodynamic tension air flossing and gliding techniques. Well, flossing and gliding, gliding are inter, inter, interchangeable terms. So uh, they're interchangeable. Mills manipulation, technique benefit compression. Well, Mills manipulation might be effect, might be helpful for someone who has a radial tunnel presentation. It's considered like when James Syriax first described that, he borrowed it. Now, wherever he, okay, we won't go back too much to the history, but that's a soft tissue manipulation, not a joint manipulation. So it could certainly be beneficial for a radial tunnel presentation, not so much a median nerve compression. Nerve flossing for a home program in the clinic, make sure the patient can turn it on and off, and they do at least 10 or 15 reps to work out if it makes them feel better or worse. Minimal intervention every couple of hours, many times a day. Otherwise, you just send someone home, like they do 100 reps of a median nerve globe, you may never see them again, and they might be recommending none of their family ever see you either. <laughs> you do not want to flare up a nerve. They are not happy. You've got to be subtle about it. But yeah, teach someone how to turn the symptoms on and off. Okay. All right. Okay. Any more questions, guys? I remember. Uh, remember this from your weekend intensive one time. You said it's easy to overtreat a nerve, and it's easy oh. to make the nerve angry. I think I remember this exact words from your class. <laughs> I'm looking, at some of the, yeah, I'm looking at Amol's question. Dry needling and effective treatment. Oh, yeah. Now, just don't hit the nerve directly. Like there's an Irish case study of hitting the radial nerve, radial nerve directly, leading to radial palsy. You don't want to do that. Uh, yes, but pronator syndrome and supinator. If you can dry needle pronator or pronator teres or supinator, you can have a big impact on these and also cervical mortifida at the same time. Someone's got a double crush, work on double double crush. Yeah, I've seen some people try and dry needle subclavius muscle. That's a little bit, that's a little bit difficult at times. So yeah. Does nerve flossing help in a neural tear, thoracic TOS? Only if you first free up the mechanical restrictions. Like someone's got a neural thoracic outlet syndrome. It's the outlet that's under compression. So open up the outlet, work on pec minor, work on the upper thoracic mobility. Yes, neurodynamic mobilization is going to be a component of it. It's probably going to be more like global neurodynamic glides, depending on their areas of sensitivity change. But don't just try to force a nerve to glide through a tunnel that's already tight. Now, that's very me me mechanistic, as I said it. But let's just not do interventions in isolation, because TOS is a combined presentation. Postural habits, tissue shortening. Uh, so don't force a nerve to move. Yeah. Neural symptoms manifesting at night, that's when you get a shift to more blood flow sometimes. And a lot of times nerves are happier when they're moving. So if you, a lot of people at night times lay and they curl their wrists to their body, great way to bring on carpal tunnel syndrome, or they hyperflex their elbows, great way to bring on tubital tunnel syndrome, or they lay on one arm, great way to bring on radial tunnel syndrome. So those things happen at night time. Uh, what exactly happened with nerve and the neurodynamic mobilization? Well, you can't stretch a nerve. You can just glide it. Now, well, you can stretch them 
<laughs> nerves is, the design of nerves is pretty amazing. Internally, they can actually unwind a little bit. They're actually slight, this, the actual internal parts of a nerve where the ax axon fibers run are slightly wiggly. So when they can stretch about 3%, after that they deoxygenate. So really you're preventing deoxygenation of a nerve as it glides when you do neurodynamic mobilization mechanically. And that when something deoxygenates, you get a horrible chemical response. So you get radiculopathies. So yeah, that's some of what's going on when you do neurodynamic. And you're retraining the cortical interpretation of what the nerve is doing. You're, you're massaging your thalamus, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> or your, it's, uh, it's, yeah. I mean, like neurodynamics, we've only been talking about it for about 300 years. But a lot written the last 30. Okay. Okay. People are staying on a bit tonight, TJ. I thought this was... <laughs> they want to listen to you. <laughs> I'm not sure. Maybe they just, they can't work out how to leave. <laughs> Is numbness changing to paresthesia? Well, the, if you start to regain some neural function, yeah, that's an improvement, but it's a bit like, um, you don't, don't do this intentionally, but if you sleep on your arm and your arm goes to sleep and then when it starts to come back, it's gonna really hurt for a while. You gotta watch out for that. But yeah, uh, pain sensation is typically the last thing you lose. So if someone's got total numbness and they can't even feel pain and that comes back, yeah, it's positive, but it may not be, it may not be pleasant. So let's try not to get there. Uh, does TOS differentiate? No. Okay. Yeah, have a plethora of all these folks, like I, me and my schedule. But, okay. All right. I do have another meeting coming up. <laughs> so it's in a little bit. It's a Sunday, though. Okay. So.